Okay, good morning. Um, what I have today is probably a bit heavy on two points, a bit heavy on the time aspect and also the data aspect. So I, I might skip a couple of slides. Um, so although I am going to talk about high geophysics data, um, a lot of what we are doing, we believe, is, is directly applicable to other disciplines just as we believe what other disciplines are doing is directly applicable to us. So we have tried wherever possible to I identify issues which are generic. Um, one distinguishing feature of our work is, is the scale. So today it's 100 petabytes, so that's 100,000 terabytes. And we expect it to reach 5 exabytes, so an exabyte is the next level up from petabytes, after that you get zettabytes and yottabytes and so forth. What I will not talk about are the, the issues about trusted repositories. I, I think that's kind of a given. There's not really any point in having an exabyte repository if you cannot trust it. Um, okay. I will also talk about some other aspects such as costs. Uh, I think that's another area where we think we have quite a good handle on what we are doing. We think we understand the costs today, how they break down, particularly in terms of personnel and, and materials, which are the way we budget things at CERN. So materials covers obviously hardware, but also licensing costs and maintenance, and, and personnel covers personnel. And the reason for understanding costs is really to build a business case so you can go to the funding agencies, uh, as well as the general public, and, and make a, uh, a good case for funding. Okay, so a few words about the motivation for doing this. Um, you see this, this picture with all these different squares with U, C, T, all these uh, uh, strange letters and, and symbols. So we have a, a very, very good model of nature, which is called the standard model, uh, which has evolved over the past four or five decades. Um, but one thing was missing, and that was a mechanism which explained why some of these particles had mass. I should ask if there are any physicists here before I continue. Um, and this was postulated in the, in the 60s, as I'm sure you've heard by now, by, by Professor Higgs and a few other people. And this became known as the Higgs mechanism. And with time, so the, when the first paper, the, the first paper of Higgs was actually rejected, and when he resubmitted it, he actually included uh, a very important addition, which was actually the prediction that there would be a particle associated with this field. Now, my belief is that the other people who worked on this didn't mention it because it was so obvious. I mean, there's always a particle associated with a field, like the photon is associated with the electromagnetic field and so forth. Anyway, um, from this seed, this grain of an idea, grew a project which was first proposed in the late 70s and started in, in the 2000s. It took many, many years to plan, construct the Large Hadron Collider. So the Large Hadron Collider is a 27-kilometer ring, 100 meters underground. It's cooled to 1.9 degrees Kelvin. And in cooling the ring down, this 27-kilometer ring, it shrinks by 80 meters, which is rather significant. So there are a lot of engineering issues in, in building such a, a machine. Um, the central pitch on the right is, is one of the many magnets. And some of the technology that we have used to build the LHC is actually being applied to other problems, such as carbon emissions. Uh, energy problems. So there are, um, for example, the whole machine, this 27 kilometer ring, is, is a superconducting device. And if we could have essentially zero transmission loss uh, energy flow, this would be something very important. A huge amount of energy is lost in transmission. Uh, another technique is, is the vacuum technology is being tested for extremely high efficiency solar panels, which could be deployed uh, here, it could be deployed in the Gulf states, it could be employed in many parts of the world, with something like 95% efficiency. 
So the sun could do be generate power, it could run desalination parts, cooling, uh, heating when necessary, and, and so forth. So these are all rather direct spin-offs, which we think in the next decades could make a very big impact to some of the major problems uh, facing all of humanity. I mean, water issues are facing really everybody, as we heard uh, recently, for example, in California. The bottom picture shows one of the big detectors. It's the CMS detector. And I've chosen that because that is the uh, collaboration that India is in, involved in, one of the two collaborations that India is involved in. So what this looks like in terms of data rates, uh, this is a rather old picture. These rates have gone up. Um, we have these four experiments that take data at a few gigabytes a second. Now, this figure is after several filters. So this is the rate that we intend to store persistently and permanently. Uh, if you want the rate before the filters, there are many orders of magnitude higher, but not really relevant. Uh, if you listen to talks about the square kilometer array, they tend to talk about the rates pre-filter. Uh, which is maybe also not fair. So our, our rates uh, are rather com comparable, at least what we project for after the year 2000, uh, 2020 sorry, will be roughly the same as the square kilometre rate at that stage. Um, when the data reaches the computer centre, there's some processing there, and then it's sent out in this uh, rather strange manner to the Tier 1 sites, there's roughly 10, uh, and the tier two sites, an order of 100, uh, for different sorts of processing. And again, I'll, I'll mention the, the two tier two centers in India. There's one in Calcutta for the ALICE experiment, a heavy iron experiment, and one in Mumbai for the CMS, the one I showed before. Now, this is all designed for um, very fast analysis um, and, and processing of the data. And in fact, we as was announced when the, the Higgs discovery was, was made, we were able to turn data into discovery in record time, just a matter of days. Data came off the detector and, and was in the paper in a matter of days, when previously this was weeks or even months. So this is really a vindication of, of grid or cloud technology. Um, however, this is probably not what you want to do for long-term preservation, having your data anywhere over 200 sites. And that is something that we are addressing now. So it works very well for ongoing production, but there are different considerations when you want to uh, retain the data for much longer periods. Uh, if you look 20 years or 30 years into the future, you almost certainly will not need a grid anyway because the, the advancement in technology will be so much, as we've seen from the past, that, that a very small number of machines could actually do the job. Um, Continuing to talk about data, the, the graph here in green, this shows the accumulated data gradually rising to 100 petabytes. But what it also shows is, is data scrubbing, which is in the dark green. So in uh, parallel to data taking, uh, and with the new data as well as the old data, we are constantly scrubbing for errors uh, and detecting and correcting them wherever possible. So this is something, as I mentioned yesterday on the panel, which I think is extremely important, is it is not as simple as just storing the data once. There are many, many issues, whether the data is on disk or tape, there are every possible thing can go wrong, and you have to be constantly checking for that and, and correcting it. OK, so once again, I'll get back to the timeline. So I mentioned that the LHC was proposed uh, in the late 70s, but it has a long future ahead of it. Uh, we are just more or less at the beginning, we're in the shutdown, long shutdown one, and it, there will be many, many runs into the future with increasing data rates. Now, one question people often ask is, why do we need so much data? And what you can see gradually building up here is, is the Higgs signal. And ask yourself, when do you think a convincing signal actually appears. And it, it's relatively late on. I would say it's at least half, if not two-thirds of the way through that. So what that means is if we had 
a hundredth of the data or a tenth of the data, we would never have been able to make this discovery. And what we are looking for now are actually much rarer processes than these. And we are also, we are already filtering out uh, a, a, a very large background of this data. Um, so I, I, I will not show that again. So a anyway, once you've done this uh, uh, and you've discovered the Higgs, then what you achieve is a very happy man. So. Um, okay, so in addition to the 100 petabytes of data that we have today, we have uh, about um, a billion, an American billion files, a thousand million files. As I said, the LHC is only at the beginning. We have these many runs ahead of us, uh, and these runs are expected to increase the data rate um, from a few tens of petabytes a year to a few hundreds of petabytes a year. And, and I'll, I'll probably skip over those slides a bit. So what we expect is after 2020, we will take something like uh, 400 petabytes a, a year of raw data every year, plus a lot of derived data. So my guess is something like 500 petabytes of data. So 500 times 10 is, is five exabytes. So that's not a very difficult calculation. So I now want to give a, a very high-level overview of what is the scientific motivation for keeping this data. So there are other reasons. There's educational outreach, but I just want to concentrate on three main arguments. So the first is the long tail of papers. So when data taking stops, uh, scientific output does not stop. And, and you can see there that there's a tail of publications. This is for the previous collider we had at CERN LEP, which was in the same tunnel, that last at least 10 years. And in fact, e even now, 15 years after data taking stopped, some important papers are still being written on that data. Um, another argument is new theoretical insights, which might not be completely obvious from this, this diagram. Um, but a lot of our work is driven by theory. And you don't know when theory is going to advance. It can be one year later, it can be 20 years later, or even much, much longer than that. And that allows you to go back to the old data and reanalyze it according to these new theoretical models. And in, in some cases, get much, much better results than was originally possible. Um, another argument is from one generation of machines to the next. Uh, in the case we are now, it's going from a discovery machine like the Large Hadron Collider to what might be a precision machine to look at any of the discoveries in very, very fine detail. And this is probably something like three decades or more. So all of these reasons can be uh, translated to something very simple. You keep data for one, two, or, or three decades. Uh, we don't believe that there's any scientific motivation for keeping this data for 100 years, a millennium, or something like that. Although equally, we don't believe there's any reason to destroy it. Uh, as we will see when we get to the costs, uh, the costs eventually shrink to such a level uh, that we believe it, they, they can be affordably kept, uh, maybe paid for by some endowment mechanism or something like that. So a very high level overview of how we break down uh, this, this problem. Uh, if there's time, I, I will show something about each of these. If there's not, I'll only talk about data. Uh, so the global idea is that there's an overall overarching portal, uh, possibly even a portal of portals shared with other disciplines. So citizen scientists, funding agencies, uh, high energy physicists, anybody can access all the data that's available, see what the access uh, policies are uh, and so forth through this very simple web interface. Um, then there would be the, these, these other layers which we would be building on tools in collaboration uh, with other communities such as the digital library community um, and so forth. Um, to switch a bit to data, I, I mentioned that we expect to have five exabytes by about 2030. Uh, this is a very, very simple model. This is not a prediction of the LHC data. This is a model based on starting with 10 petabytes and growing first at 50 petabytes a year and then increasing growth, which is an approximation to what we expect. Um, the reason that we did this study was to look at what 
the costs would be. So here you see, um, based on technology predictions, the total number of disks you would need with a 10% disk cache in front of your tape archive. Uh, so you see that both the disks and the number of tapes slightly rises and then reduces significantly. Um, more importantly are, are the costs, and, and there are many ways you can look at this. Um, and the costs become, in the long term, uh, relatively affordable if you consider the scale. So we're talking the scale of several exabytes uh, and that the cost is something like $2 million a year. Now, if you compare that with the cost of generating the data, which is maybe $2 billion a year, uh, and the scientific value of the data, you can say this is relatively modest. And if you compare it to the scientific value in terms of the output, uh, the publications, the PhDs, the people trained to then go into industry. And I'm sure it was not the Hanji physicists who were responsible for the bust. <laughs> they were the good ones. Uh, you can see that, that actually this has value that you can argue about with your funding agency and, and, and hopefully get long-term funding. Okay, so although I haven't explained, uh, how much longer do I have? 10 minutes, okay. Uh, I, I will quickly go through these different things, but I, I, I just give a pre-summary of, of the five points that we see. So the portal, this is something we want to build in collaboration with other disciplines. And, and here, actually, the RDA interest group has, with one simple email, uh, benefited us a great deal because we were able to get some examples of other portals. So rather than reinvent the wheel, we want to work with other disciplines and do something uh, in collaboration. In terms of digital libraries, I think you all know there's a lot of work going on there, and we simply want to build on that. Sustainable bit preservation, this is really what I've been talking about with these extra stores, uh, the funding uh, profile, the funding model. And we believe that actually there's an opportunity right now in terms of a, an EU call in Horizon 2020 to, to build this. Uh, and in that call, it mentions certified repositories. We think the two go hand in hand. And we believe that, in fact, working with the RDA, we could even uh, propose standards for the interfaces and the functionality of such, a, of such a bit repository and then demonstrate it as part of this call. The two areas which I think are still a bit unaddressed, uh, certainly in our discipline, is this whole issue of knowledge capture and preservation, where for our data, uh, the amount of software and knowledge you need to process it is simply huge and is growing faster than the data is growing. Uh, we had hundreds of terabytes at LEP, but a very small amount of software. We have hundreds of petabytes at LHC, but software that needs teams of thousands to, to generate and maintain. A new area, well, it's not a new area, but it's an area that seems to be gaining traction recently is this idea of, of open data and open big data, because you have to say big data these days, um, where, again, this is something where not in the first Horizon 2020 calls, but maybe in subsequent ones, there could be some funding to work on this, where, if I understand open data correctly, it would actually simplify uh, a lot of the other work. And I think this could be a big opportunity for everybody and also for the Research Data Alliance, the RDA, uh, if it was able to take a leading role in, in pushing open data forward, which I think would help in all disciplines. Okay, so the portal, it might look like something like this, the planetary data system. Uh, there's suggestions we build it on uh, the Invinio uh, software, which is used for the Zenodo platform that some of you might see but it's something very much for this sort of thing to allow people to make their data citable, discoverable, and so forth. Uh, the documentation for how you uh, process the data, uh, the papers about the data, and so forth, uh, logically we would use this Inspire digital library platform, which again is a collaboration built with other uh, partners and disciplines and funded by the EU. Uh, this is a replacement for the Spires tool from the 90s, so it's something that has already something like a 30-year history in, in the high physics world. Um, 
Another area is this, I, I mentioned the grid and, and the costs, and looking back in time, we see, that, sorry, this is a bit complicated time slide, but on the time scale of two or three decades, the costs of the computing go from 100 million a year to essentially zero. Um, so obviously we have to maintain, update, replace all the hardware while the LHC is running, but for long-term use, where in fact the usage would be much, much lower than it is today, uh, we have this very nice technology evolution which simply reduces the cost to something that, that is almost affordable by, uh, by, certainly by a single institute, and in the case of the storage, uh, it, it's available by individuals. So if you wanted to store uh, all of the data from LEP, you could go out and buy that, that disk your, yourself and put it on your desk. Um, in terms of capturing the knowledge, uh, a solution that got some support, quite some support yesterday, the use of uh, virtualization is something that is, is being investigated. Some people are very skeptical and our uh, response to that is, okay, let's, let's try it. So let's have a, a challenge with some predefined metrics and let's do it over some years and, and we can actually already look back because we can pres try preserving um, a system from five years ago. We don't have to wait for five years into the future. So if we take that system and carry it forward three, five years, we already have about a decade of experience. And if other people are going in this direction, uh, we think that maybe we can together find a long-term solution. And open data, I already mentioned, but these slides show uh, through the EU logo that they are quite interested in this, and so they should be. So to give some comparison about the, the, the costs, which I have already mentioned, um, in the LHC collaborations, there's about 3,000 people. So I don't know how much people get paid, but 3,000 FTEs certainly has a significant cost. The annual cost of the LHC computing grid is about 100 million euros. Um, the database service we have at CERN, which is based on Oracle, is about 2 million Swiss francs a year for materials and 2 million for, for personnel. Sorry for using different currencies. You can treat them as the same. Uh, the, the euro is 20% stronger, 25% stronger than the Swiss franc at the moment, but basically we're talking ballpark figures and, and so it's the same. So one euro equals one Swiss franc equals one dollar equals one Canadian dollar um, for the, this purpose. Um, when we were moving the experiments to the grid, the, the team that supported them varied between uh, four to ten people. And it's exactly that sort of number that we think could really make a massive difference in terms of capturing the knowledge, the data we have, for long-term preservation. And I, I think uh, in terms of absolute cost, uh, dollar, euro, Swiss franc cost, or absolute headcount, these are actually very modest numbers. So it's one per mil. And I believe that if the scientists, who are the ones who negotiate with the funding agencies, cannot use these numbers to make their case, it means they're not interested. And they obviously have conflicting interests because it's the next great machine they want to build, the 100 kilometer one I mentioned before. Uh, if you want to build a 100 kilometer machine round a mountain uh, that will take 30 years of tunneling or something like that, the funds have to come from somewhere. Uh, but is it really justified to completely turn off the tap? Or can you let a few drips con continue particularly as there's strong scientific motivation to do that. So you, when the new machine turns on, you want to measure uh, results that you have previously seen to check it's actually working correctly and it's calibrated correctly. So in fact, if you don't do this, you are simply shooting yourself and nobody else in the foot. Okay, my final slide. Long-term preservation, I think it's important to remember it's a journey and not a destination. So it's a journey that you probably actually never 
conclude. You're on it for life. Uh, it's also best not to venture out alone. You never know what might happen. I think it really is important to have a clear understanding of the costs, uh, not only to science but also society, of the direct and indirect benefits of what you're doing. This is the only way you will ever get funding. I think I've already convinced you that we are very eager to share our knowledge and experience uh, about bit preservation uh, from the petascale to the exascale. And I would like to acknowledge uh, all of the help that you have given us. Uh, I've been involved in this for one year, one month, and 10 days. And we have made massive progress through collaboration with other disciplines and projects. Uh, simply looking at things different ways, understanding what you are doing, and realizing that we are not alone, and we don't have to start from scratch. And I think this is something that we all agree on. We need to work together. So thank you very much.